Hi, everybody. It's really great to see you today. Um, we had a wonderful announcement this morning. I'm going off my script I'll, immediately. Um, we announced a record fundraising year for Berkeley of $569 million, beating our best year ever by $80 million. I just want to, because... It's not about me. It is about a team, and it's about all of you, because fundraising is everybody's job. Um, alumni engagement is everybody's job. Outreach, it's all of our jobs. And you do things that support the development operation, and you don't even know it. So I just want to say thank you, and especially thank you to all of the advancement community members who are here today. Um, with that, I just want to say I'm so pleased to be here with you today. It's really, really an honor to get to give the closing remarks to, with my colleagues here, 650 of you. You're a really impressive looking group. Um, I, I want to share some observations from my campus experiences today and from my career as a whole. Uh, I'd also like to commiserate around some of the challenges that we face right now, and I'd like to share some tips on navigating those challenges, and I'd really like to also celebrate with all of you. Um, so let's do a little bit of celebrating first, since I already kicked us off with the news about the record year. Um, you are all a part of something really, really special and unique this year. It is Berkeley's 150th birthday, and I'm sure you've seen the banners on campus celebrating our milestone moments, and you've seen the social media feeds and the website and the highlights from our last 150 years. It's really something to be so proud of. And in March, we celebrated Charter Day, and we were at the Haas Pavilion with a few thousand of our closest friends, faculty, staff, and alumni. I mean, in case you missed it and you couldn't be there, I wanted to take a moment to watch this video, and I encourage you to sing if you are so inspired. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking of celebrations, we also just celebrated our first year of Carol Chris's chancellorship. Um, I have to say, I personally find her leadership style inspiring and comforting. She's very fast-paced, she's visionary, she is energetic, she's inclusive, and she's fearless. And of course, she is the first woman to serve as Berkeley's chancellor. I think that we are very, yes. I think we are very fortunate that she is our chancellor, and I think we are very fortunate that she is our chancellor at this point in our history. You know, let's face it, the length of tenure of individuals serving as university presidents and chancellors uh, has been decreasing. Uh, simply put, leaders are not staying in these jobs as long as they used to. Of the 81 public research universities in America classified as Research One, um, 56 have experienced presidential turnover over the past five years. Um, I just returned from a meeting in New York City over the weekend with uh, my colleagues of vice presidents and vice chancellors for advancement from the top 50 fundraising universities in the country, uh, private and public. And presidential transition is just an ongoing hot topic for that group, and that's just 50 universities. Uh, also, according to the American College President study from the American Council on Education, in 2016, less than a third of college presidents were women. Um, I'm really glad to see that Berkeley is doing its part to grow this number, and of course, that is something we just celebrated. Um, but it is a little concerning. And we'll talk a little bit more about this a little later in my presentation. So let's shift gears now and, and talk about some of the challenges that, that I feel we are facing as Berkeley staff members. And um, we don't have a lot of time today, but I thought I'd focus in on three areas, uh, change, relentlessness, and ambiguity. So we've been through an incredible amount of change over the last few years, including, as I said, leadership turnover, and you all know. Um, I am curious to know by a show of hands, how many of us have had our supervisor or our supervisor's supervisor turn over in the last four years? Wow. Is that surprising, Joe? No. <laughs> now you have to count them all, though. <laughs> 
Now, I'd also like to ask, how many of us have moved our offices in the last four years? Yeah. So which is more stressful, the, the personnel changes or the, or the space changes? Any thoughts? Yes. All of it, yes. yes. <laughs> um, I've been here for four years. I celebrated four years on July 1st. And let me just share a little bit about personal change that I've been through. Um, I have served with, let me make sure it's working, OK, two chancellors, three EVCPs, five vice chancellors for research, three vice chancellors for equity and inclusion, three vice chancellors for administration, two athletic directors, and two vice chancellors for student affairs. And there's been a few more, but I, I thought that was enough to make the point. Um, and the point being, this is a lot of change. And we all have a very different tolerance for change, right? Um, as shown in the previous slide, the sort of simple spectrum of like it or hate it. Um, I have come to discern that I think I personally have a fair, fairly high tolerance for change. Um, I'm not cheering for it, but I think, you know, I'm not like the person on the right side of the earlier cartoon, yay, change. Um, but, and, and I'm not sure it was always the case for me that I had a high tolerance for change. I think there's just been so much change for me personally in the last four years that maybe I've become numb to stressing about it, or maybe I just accept it as the new norm. That being said, I, I think that one of the most important things we can do with our colleagues is to recognize that staff members are on very, very different scales of comfort with change, from hating it to loving it. And we need to acknowledge that that is okay. No one response is the right one. Uh, managers need to think proactively about what constant change means for the morale on their teams. Um, as a manager, uh, I will share, and I know that I am guilty of this, we sometimes are so caught up in responding to change or implementing the change that we forget to communicate enough with our team members. And you have to communicate up, you have to communicate down, you have to communicate out, around, and you have to do it more than once. Um, especially here at Berkeley, but I suspect most large institutions, be they private or public. And it's not just acknowledging and talking about change, but it's also asking for input and listening to our colleagues about their concerns and their needs during a time of change. And then staff have to understand, I think, that you know, for management, this is also a balancing act in terms of how much can be discussed about the change and when it can be discussed, especially if it involves personnel decisions. Um, when I was interviewing to come to Berkeley, that would have been in the late fall of 2013, early spring of 2014, I remember one of the deans during an interview telling me that Berkeley leads from the middle. And I, I love that, it really stuck with me. I went back to Austin and I said, we lead from the middle, we lead from the middle. And they thought, what book did she read? Um, <laughs> but I, I think that is a value that we actually should all embrace and can embrace and should be proud of at Berkeley. So on to relentlessness. This is a hamster wheel treadmill desk as profiled in Time Magazine in 2014. I cannot decide if this is ingenious or evil, or both. It's probably both. Um, do you all have days that feel like this? Yeah. I know that I do, and the weight of relentlessness can be quite heavy on us. Um, our workloads are often increasing, and often without new resources to support the growth. Simply stated, we are being asked to do more with the same or less. Um, if you are a manager, if you are a manager, I have a question for you. And you don't have to raise your hand, just silently answer it. Are you effective at delegating? And if you think you are effective, how do you know? And have you asked your staff? Um, a de effective delegation is a skill that we can practice and get better at, just like any other skill. Um, some of you may know Dr. Amy Levine. Uh, she is a leadership coach here in the Bay Area. Amy and I recently had a conversation about a number of topics, including effective delegation. And she gave me a simple one-page document that she shares with her clients with suggestions for effective delegation. Um, there are five basic steps she suggests. We reviewed them, and she asked if I used these steps or something like them. And I have to admit, when I read them, I couldn't say that I had been following them or following them consistently, and that was very revealing for me. Um, so I wanted to share with you her five steps for effective delegation, because I'm trying to use them more in my work life. When you delegate, you need to communicate the following. Number one, what exactly is the task you're delegating? Number two, by when does it need to be completed? 
And number three, what actions do you want the employee to take to complete this? Number four, do you want the employee to check in as they work on the task? And five, communicate what role this task plays in regard to the larger project. So I'm, I'm not saying that delegation is a simple solution to a relentless work environment. It, it is not. But I think it cannot hurt to refine and hone our skills in this area. I certainly feel that's something I want to work on in the coming year. I also think we have to ask ourselves, uh, this is hard, what are we going to stop doing? Let me repeat that. What are we going to stop doing? Uh, universities are terrible at this. Um, I've worked for two large research one public institutions, and we are idea generators. That is, that is what we are here to do. Um, and you, you and I are not going to change that aspect of university culture, and I'm not sure we would want to. But answering the question of what we will stop doing or what we will not do is unbelievably hard, but I encourage your teams to have honest and direct conversations about this question, and then to really communicate honestly with your constituents about the decisions that you've made. So ambiguity in the workplace. Um, I'm not going to say something that you wouldn't agree with here. It is stressful. Ambiguity is stressful. It is stressful for employees because when we don't have all the details, oftentimes, oftentimes our go-to or our first go-to is, well, it, it must be negative. This must be something negative. I go to a negative place. Ambiguity is stressful for managers because you don't always have all the answers, and you may not even have a clear path forward yet, yet you have to keep things moving and you have to keep morale up. When you combine ambiguity with relentlessness and constant change, um, it is a recipe for problems, and I worry that it is a recipe for people leaving Berkeley. So let me suggest a tip um, from the world of major gift fundraising. Um, in the face of ambiguity, ask questions and make them open-ended questions versus questions with yes and no answers. This is really one of the first key lessons of fundraising. The best fundraisers ask open-ended questions, they're engaging questions, and they are very good listeners. Why, you might ask. I mean, isn't a fundraiser's job to sell the university? You know, really, on the contrary, what we are trying to do when fundraising is done well is to understand a donor's values and their aspirations and to connect those values and wishes with opportunities for giving on our campus. When we listen and we understand a donor's values, we raise more money. It, it is a truism of this industry that I've been in for a couple of decades. Um, let me give you an example, and bear with me because it's kind of cutesy, but I thought it would work. So I'm a Berkeley fundraiser, and I'm going, I am a Berkeley fundraiser. I, Julie, am going to meet with a graduate of the College of Chemistry from the 1970s. Our conversation could go something like this. Dr. Oski, our College of Chemistry, where you obtained your PhD, is the number one ranked program in the country. Were you aware of that? The answer, yes, I am aware of that. Okay, I, I got the answer from him, but I didn't really learn much about Dr. Oski. So here's a different approach. Dr. Oski, can you tell me about particular members of the College of Chemistry faculty who played a role in your success as a graduate student? His answer, I will never forget Professor Ludwig. I thought that I was going to have to leave graduate school when my mother passed away after a long illness and he made it possible for me to stay at Cal both by helping me to find funding sources and through his personal support of me during my mother's illness. I owe my 40-year career at Caltech to him. Let me tell you more about him. And then Dr. Oski spends 30 minutes telling me about this faculty member who had great resonance on his life and his career. So what did I learn in the second example? Um, I learned that Dr. Oski understands the value of faculty in the lives of our students that he understands the need for financial support for graduate students, and that he particularly feels indebted to Dr. Ludwig. And as we think about a possible philanthropic ask of him and a gift he might consider making, perhaps I would position for him creating a graduate fellowship in the professor's honor, or an endowed chair even. Um, so this is, this is kind of a simplified example to make my point, but just to reiterate, my point being that I think asking questions of our colleagues when things feel ambiguous is an excellent tactic for clarifying things and for perhaps, perhaps bringing our stress levels down. I had to, of course, use a Cal Athletics image. Um, 
Now, as we think around about the issues around change and relentlessness and ambiguity, I would propose that we consider some additional actions we can take to manage things. Um, a word that I've become very fond of in the last few years is pivot. I think people who work in UDAR, uh, especially people on the management team, know I'm very fond of the word pivot. Um, pivoting is one way to think about how you react to change. In a fight or flight stress response, you may feel you either have to act out against the change or you may feel the need to shut down and perhaps even ignore that the change is happening. But a pivot is neither of these things. Um, and you know, maybe we can learn something from the startup world about pivoting. Eric Ries, a popular entrepreneurship blogger, a consultant and a former entrepreneur in residence at Harvard Business School, describes the notion of pivot in the startup world uh, as follows. The idea that successful startups change directions but stay grounded in what they've learned. They keep one foot in the past and place one foot in a new possible future. In this way, new ventures process what they have already learned from past success and failure and apply these insights in new areas. There are lessons learned. You may feel hesitant to want to apply Silicon Valley lessons to our experience here at Berkeley as staff. But I would suggest that lessons learned from startup and entrepreneurial cultures do have something to offer us, because those are environments that I believe can feel quite relentless, full of change, and perhaps even ambiguous at times. And Joe, you're the expert on the business world, so <laughs> you, you can, at the end, you can validate if that's true or not. Um, resilience. So how many of you have read or watched Sheryl Sandberg's commencement speech from 2016? It was the first time that she talked about her husband's death in public. Um, there was not a, tr a dry eye in the stadium. It was very powerful. Scientists tell us that determination, self-worth, and kindness are what make us resilient. And I would suggest that in a work environment, all three of these things play a role in our ability to address the challenges that are in front of us on any given day. But how many of us actually think about kindness as part of, work, of the work environment? Yet as human beings, I think we instinctively know that kindness is an important factor in terms of helping others and ourselves to bounce back from the obstacles and the hard times. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Greater Good Science Center on campus? Oh good, that, that makes me happy. Um, if you're not familiar with them, and it looks like most of you are, they have a website and I highly recommend visiting it. It's greatergood.berkeley.edu. You can sign up for their newsletter, which I find to be really informative. Um, they also have a lot of really good articles and quizzes on their site. There's just, it's a tremendous resource for us on campus, and we can't really get into it today, but what I wanted to say is to encourage you to check them out if you haven't before, and in particular, I would encourage you to take a look at their many resources on building resilience in your own lives, uh, both your personal life and your professional life. Let's see, there I am. So, okay, in preparation for today, um, even though I don't like to talk about myself, <laughs> I was asked to talk a bit about my own career journey. And I was also asked to talk about my views as a woman in leadership and what I have learned. Uh, so let me, let me start off first by saying I did not set out to become a professional fundraiser or to work in higher education, but I'll get to that. Um, I've worked since the day I turned 16. I suppose for me it meant independence and freedom, but in reality, my dad said I had to work, so I did. <laughs> um, uh, you know, in college, among my various jobs, I was a work-study student. Some of you, I'm sure, were too. I worked at a shoe store in Brookline. Um, I went to Boston University. You might have seen that on my bio. I was an RA. I was a resident assistant, and I worked as a banquet waiter in Copley Square. Uh, I graduated from BU with a history degree, and I moved back to Dallas from Boston because at that time, there did not seem to be many jobs in Boston, and Dallas's economy was supposedly in a better place. Plus, I could live at home. Every, every college drag graduate's dream, right? <laughs> Um, I remember, and I mean, I remember this. I remember crying on the plane ride home to Dallas. <laughs> My poor father. Um, I'd lived away from home for four years, including most of the summers. So to me, it felt like a failure to go back. You're gonna really, you're sure you're wondering why I have this picture up. When I got back to Dallas um, and started my job search, I waited tables for two months in a restaurant in Dallas. Specifically, I worked here at the famous Campisi's Egyptian Lounge in Dallas. This is a picture of it. 
Um, they do have great pizza. It's an iconic site. It has a really crazy history. Feel free to Google it. I'll just tell you one story. Jack Ruby was a, was a, a longtime patron. It opened in 1946 when he was arrested for shooting Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, he asked for his friend and Campisi founder, Joe Campisi, to come see him in jail, which Joe Campisi and his wife did. Let's just say it was a place full of characters. <laughs> but it was a good buffer for me post-college. Um, I was hired for my first professional position working for a textile company that sourced home textiles from India for customers such as Spiegel, Pier One, Cost Plus, L.L. Bean, et cetera. I was the assistant to the owner. That's what I started in. And by the time I left four years later, I was the product development manager. I got to spend a fair amount of time in India, which was really fascinating for a 20-something from Texas. But I really desperately wanted to be here. Austin. Uh, this is a really iconic Austin picture from February of 1888. This is the Texas State Capitol under construction, and the crew is getting ready to hoist the Goddess of Liberty to the top of the Capitol. Um, so other than two years in Georgia for graduate school, Austin was the place that I lived longer than anywhere else, and I will say it really shaped me as a person. When I left graduate school, I had two job offers in front of me in Austin. One was working for the State Historic Preservation Office, and the other serving as the executive director of one of Austin's oldest nonprofits, Preservation Austin. You can probably guess which job I took, um, Preservation Austin. And so my fundraising career really began then. I was very fortunate to work for three different nonprofit agencies in Austin, um, two as executive director and one as a senior director of development um, and communications. Um, they were very different jobs, very different sectors, um, you know, preservation and uh, environmental causes, and then working for a family violence rape crisis center. Um, I will say this. Uh, each job was one that I was recruited to consider through my networks. In other words, I wasn't looking for a job at the time, but someone came to me with an opportunity. And I, you know, I feel very lucky that that was a trajectory for me and my career in Austin. And I honestly expected to stay in the nonprofit sector my entire career. And then the UT Austin School of Architecture approached me. And I had no interest in working for UT. I mean, I just cannot emphasize this enough. <laughs> Uh, because I had heard all kinds of crazy stories about working in fundraising at a university, and it did not sound appealing to me. So, <laughs> yeah, ironic. The dean of the school knew me through uh, some of the faculty who I knew through Preservation Austin. I'd also served on the city of Austin Historic Landmark Commission. A dear friend who's an emeritus professor at UT said, well, just meet with the dean, you know? And I said, all right, you know, I guess I'll, I'll be polite and take the meeting. Um, I, won't, I will never forget that meeting because the dean his name is Fritz Steiner. He's a pen now. He started it by saying to me, what do I need to do to convince you to come here? So flash forward, many meetings with faculty and staff, and I accepted his offer to join the team. So I guess my lesson here is uh, you just never know. <laughs> Some, something that you seemingly reject on first blush may ultimately be one of your best life decisions, and I can honestly say that joining UT was one of my best decisions. So here we are. And honestly, I could have lived in Austin the rest of my life, but Scott Biddy and Nick Dirks convinced me to give Berkeley a try. And the more that I came here to interview and the more people that I met, the more I fell in love with the place. Um, the spirit of activism and community is very similar to Austin and resonates with me. Uh, I always say that Berkeley's prestige led to my interest in coming here, but the people sold me on the job in making the move. And so now that I've been here a little over four years and I'm the first woman to serve in this role at Berkeley, it seems timely to reflect on being a woman in leadership in higher education. The first thing I'd like to note is that being a woman in leadership in the public sector is probably no better or worse than the private sector. We are dealing with the same issues, and frankly, at times, I have thought that perhaps the private sector is ahead of us in terms of how we proactively deal with and respond to issues such as sexual harassment. But I think we have had a wake-up call here at Berkeley, and I hope, I really hope and believe that we will lead around these issues in higher education going forward. The second thing that I would note is that we still have a lot of work to do in higher ed to diversify, especially in our management ranks. Um, I mentioned earlier being together with this group in New York over the weekend of my peers. It's a predominantly male group, and it's, it's like 100% Caucasian. We really have to do better. We must do better. Yes, amen, thank you. 
Um, the third thing that I would note is that as a woman in leadership, I, I think it is my duty, it is my duty to support everyone in their personal and professional growth, and I hope I do, because I, I feel that way. But I will say I feel that I have a special obligation to ensure that our management teams and our staff are reflective of the diversity of people who make up the Cal ecosystem. And I think that's something that management needs to be attuned to at all times. And finally, um, with regard to being a woman in leadership, as my all-time favorite politician, former Texas governor Ann Richards once said, after all, Ginger Rogers did everything that Fred Astaire did. She just did it backwards and in high heels. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is where I'm gonna be a little silly and I'll go through this really quickly, but I swear there's a point here. I, I think it's really helpful to know what is most important to you in your life and only you can determine your ultimate destination. Um, others can help you chart the path, but you've got to know where you want to go. I was really fortunate in May to go to, on one of those once-in-a-lifetime vacations, and, this, and my vacation was to Italy for my husband's 50th birthday. And I have a new career aspiration, and that is to become a guitarra. Do any of you know what a guitarra is? Okay. Here's the loosely translated definition. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you. That's, that's exactly what my husband's response was. <laughs> um, I feel I am well prepared to embark on this goal. Um, that is my cat, Mikey. He made it into the presentation. I also have a dog and I love her very much, but I didn't think I could do both. My point is that it's important to have dreams and the dreams are yours. And I think that, you know, um, this is just to remind us that our dreams are ours alone, and I'm really not kidding. This is my dream. <laughs> so let's shift to you guys. As managers, we know that professional development <coughs> and career development are at the top of the list of wishes for Berkeley staff, and we also know that you often feel like you cannot even take an hour for professional development, much less a whole day. Um, we need to support each other and we need to change that dynamic. So I applaud Joe and the team who put this together today and I applaud all of you for being here. Um, in preparing for this keynote today, it's really made me reflect on my own behaviors and reminded me of things that I should be doing not only to support the staff who report to me directly, but also the larger group in my orbit. Um, you know, we all have to acknowledge that yes, we have a personal responsibility for our careers and our journeys. But none of us do this alone. And to repeat, proactive communication is key. So I was thinking a little bit about some questions that we could ask each other to, to have these discussions around um, where we want to go. For example, managers could ask staff, what is your vision for your career? What are your goals? Am I supporting your professional development to achieve your vision and goals? And if not, what do you need from me? And are there new skills that you would like to learn? Staff, I think, can ask their managers questions too. Are there any resources available that you feel would assist in my professional and personal development? Can we discuss my career goals? And what are your career goals? I think that's kind of provocative, but actually I think it's a great opportunity to share two ways about talking about career goals in the future. Um, I don't have a magic answer for you in terms of what it will take to get there and achieve your goals, but I can reflect on a few things in hindsight that I believe have served me well. One, be open to change. Two, be flexible even when it hurts. Three, be nice to everyone. You never know when you'll need their help. And four, some things are just better handled over the phone or in person than email. Email really does not convey nuance well. Oh, I just skipped ahead. Okay, so I have to wrap this up, and I think we wanted to have some time for questions. Um, I do want you guys to think about a question of, of, that I'm going to propose to you, which is, you know, what did you take away from today? Are there one or two things that really stand out for you as actions, as actionable things that you would like to do in your own career? This has really been a big investment in your career journey, so where do you want to go next? Uh, there is a reception after the session, and I really encourage all of you to stay and meet some new people, and I look forward to meeting you. Um, it's a lovely crowd of Berkeley folks, and it's hard to find a day for self-reflection, dreaming, idea generation, sharing, and brainstorming. So let's make the most out of it. With that, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to be here today. Fiat Lux, and go Bears. <laughs>